Hello, everyone. Welcome to QSS. Thanks for joining us. My name is Kevin Satzinger. I'm a researcher here at Google focusing on quantum error correction experiments, and we have one for you today. Now, in order to run the quantum algorithms of our dreams, we think that we need an error probability per operation of perhaps one in a billion or one in a trillion, while our physical qubits are limited to more like one in 1,000. And in order to cross that chasm of orders of magnitude, we plan to use quantum error correction to build a bridge, specifically encoding our quantum information into logical qubits, where the logical qubit is distributed across an array of physical qubits in such a way that it's immune to local errors on individual physical qubits. Now, getting this to work requires a very high level of performance because we're adding on a bunch of extra qubits and extra operations, a lot of opportunities for errors. And if the underlying qubits aren't good enough, then our bridge would crumble under its own weight. At the same time, given sufficient performance, we then need to operate at a very large scale because the idea is that as we scale up the code to larger and larger sizes, we can exponentially reduce the logical error probability in order to cross this chasm. Now today, we're taking an important step in this journey by comparing two different code sizes. We're going to start with a distance three surface code and then compare it to what happens when we add on a bunch more qubits to create a distance five surface code, which is about three times as many physical qubits and can handle two errors at once, while distance three can only handle one error at a time. And the key challenge here is overcoming the additional errors that we accumulate from adding on these extra qubits. And the question is, is our system performance good enough that adding these extra qubits actually improves the logical performance? In order to implement this, we use a new 72 qubit Sycamore processor, which perfectly fits a distance five service code logical qubit. This takes up 49 of the qubits, which are made of 25 data qubits, the five by five array in gold, and 24 measure qubits in blue. Each measure qubit is responsible for projectively measuring a stabilizer operator. And one way to think about how this works is we have 25 data qubits, so the Hilbert space has dimension 2 to the 25. And each of those projective measurements of the stabilizers effectively divides the dimensionality in half. So we divide it in half 24 times, and we're left with a space of dimension 2. That's our logical qubit, a distributed state that exists shared by all of the data qubits. And a way to kind of grab hold of that logical state is using these logical operators, x and z, which anti-commute with each other, and cross the array from one side to the other. And that crossing between boundaries underlies a fundamental topological property of this state. And if you'd like to learn more about that, then please check out this paper referenced at the bottom of the slide. We, all, we can also benchmark Sycamore on these 49 qubits operating simultaneously and see the same good results that we're accustomed to in this architecture. For our single qubit gates, an error probability of about 1 in 1,000. For the CZ gates, about 6 times 10 to the minus 3. For measurement, about 2%. And then DD stands for dynamical decoupling, which is the data qubit idle during the measurement and reset of the measure qubits, which we'll look at a bit more later on. Let's take a look at the surface code cycle, focusing on one measure qubit. And this is the qubit in blue that starts in the zero state. Then we do a Hadamard and four control Z gates with its four neighboring data qubits, followed by a Hadamard measurement and reset. And this operation effectively maps the operator ZZZZ on the four neighboring data qubits onto this measure qubit so that it can be measured. We can also look at this from the perspective of the data qubits, which similarly have four control Z gates to interact with their four neighboring measure qubits. And these Hadamard gates that are in between the control Z gates control what basis the measure qubits are measuring. And in our case, we use this same exact circuit for all of our data qubits so that all of the stabilizers are technically measuring Z, X, X, Z, as opposed to what you might be used to measuring Z stabilizers and X stabilizers separately. This is a bit of a technical detail, but it has the effect of largely symmetrizing the error between the X and Z logical bases. We put these together, and we run all of these stabilizers concurrently across the whole device. And in terms of the control Z gates, it looks like these four layers of highly parallel control Z gates. And these are the same layers of CZs that we used in the benchmarking on the previous slide. Now, when we're running the surface code, we're basically going to do all these stabilizers over and over again. And let's take a closer look at what that looks like, basically a day in the life of a logical qubit. And the experiment we're running here is a quantum memory. Try to remember a quantum bit. 
And the way that it works is we first initialize the data qubits into a known state. And this is a simple state of ones and zeros. There's no entanglement. But there is a known definite logical value for one of the logical operators. In this case, z logical is plus one. And there are also inferred values for half of the stabilizers. In this case, the light colored stabilizers. We already know what the parities are going into it. But this is not an eigenstate of any of the dark colored stabilizers. In order to achieve being an eigenstate of all these stabilizers at once, we simply run a cycle of the surface code measurement. So we run through all these control Z gates and measurements, and these projective measurements force the state into a simultaneous eigenstate of all the stabilizers. And this is this highly entangled and topological state that I alluded to before. Now with the state initialized, the basic process is to run repeated cycles in order to preserve the logical information and to keep track of what errors might be occurring. So let's look at a couple of examples. Say in red, we have an unwanted Z gate on one of our data qubits at the beginning of its cycle. And this propagates to two adjacent measure qubits so that we measure zero, indicated in red, while we would have expected to measure one. And having these pairs of detections indicates a nearby error. Similarly, we can look at a measure qubit error. Like in purple, this measure qubit did a great job going through all of its control Z gates, but messed up its measurement at the last moment. So it should have seen a zero, but it saw a one instead. And in the subsequent cycle, it did everything right, and we saw zero. So these two changes in parity indicate a nearby error, in this case, a measurement error. There are many more types of pairs of detections we can see. For example, if we have an error occur within the control Z gates, like indicated in blue, we might see one detection right away, and the other one will have to wait until the next cycle. So we can see separations in both space and time. At the end of this experiment, we perform a logical measurement, which is simply measuring all of the data qubits at once. And we can get one last piece of information here from these inferred parities of the final measured bits. And that lets us check in case there was some measurement error on one of the, on one of the data qubits there at the end. For example, indicated in green, where we see two one parities when from the previous measurements we would have expected to see zero. Now, once we've measured all these ones and zeros, we want to evaluate the corrected logical operator. And the process for that is called decoding, where we analyze this whole history of measurements and are basically asking the question, have any errors happened that would have flipped around the logical measurement? And taking that into account, we can arrive at a final corrected logical measurement. And the success criterion is that this final corrected or decoded measurement agrees with the initial uh, state that we know that we put in. And we can repeat this experiment many thousands of times in order to accumulate some statistics and get a su success probability. And we can also do this experiment for different durations, different numbers of cycles. Now, this process of logical memory is the core technical challenge of getting the surface code to work. This might be a little counterintuitive because in the physical qubit world, we're used to thinking of the two qubit gate as being the hardest part. But if you're running the surface code, running a logical control not gate is not very different from running memory, just changing a few things at the boundaries of your logical qubits. So we're really focusing on getting, me getting memory to work well as our core technical challenge. Let's start looking at some data. And before we get into all of these logical evaluations, we can look at a simpler kind of data, which is the probability that each measure qubit detects that some error has happened nearby. And this lets us resolve the distributions of physical error in both space and time. So here, let's take a look at this plot for our distance five code, where we've run a 25 cycle experiment. Each of the individual lines on this plot represents one of the measure qubits. And they're divided into two groups, the weight two, which are around the boundary, and talk to two data qubits, and the weight four, which are in the bulk, and talk to four data qubits. We also plot in a darker color the average over the two groups of measure qubits. One thing you'll notice is that at time equals 0 and 25, we have noticeably lower detection probabilities. And that's because these detections involve inferred parities from the data qubits and tend to show fewer errors. Finally, the heat map shows the spatial distribution of these errors, taking the average from t equals 1 to 24. Something else we can observe in this data set is that the detections slightly rise over time. In this case, an increase of about 12% relative over 25 cycles with a settling time of about five cycles. We attribute this to leakage, which is an important problem we need to mitigate head on. And note that we don't discard any repetitions in this experiment, for example, due to the detection of leakage. Now let's start to compare the distance five to other experiments, for example, the smaller distance three code. And specifically, we're going to compare to four different distance three codes indicated in red at the bottom of the slide, 
which map out the four quadrants of the distance 5 code. This provides coverage of the full distance 5 with minimal overlap. Now, you'll notice that there's some inhomogeneity in performance across the device. For example, on the left side, there are more detections than on the right side. And this is a slight departure from the ideal experiment where you would have a simple, consistent error model, and you'd be able to compare directly what happens at distance 3 and distance 5 with the exact same errors. And in order to best approximate that, the best comparison is between the distance 5 and the average of its constituent distance 3s. We observe similar behavior in terms of detection probabilities between the distance 3s and the distance 5, and you even see similarities in the spatial distributions of the detections. We can also compare to a simulation, and I won't go into great depth here, but this is a simulation with poly errors in addition to uh, leakage and stray interactions, and we see reasonable agreement with the distance 5 experiment, and this will be covered in greater detail in a subsequent presentation. Now we can move on to the logical performance data, and we're pleased to see that distance 5 narrowly outperforms distance 3. Let's look at the data in closer detail. So we have two panels here showing the same data. The top panel is showing the logical error probability, the probability that you get the wrong answer. And this would start near 0 and decay up to 0 0.5, a 50-50 coin flip. The lower panel is the same quantity, but it's this logical fidelity, 1 minus 2 times the logical error probability which starts at 1 and decays exponentially to 0. So in a semi-log plot like what we have here, you expect to see a line, as we do. In terms of the logical error probability, we can look first at the time equals 1 point and observe that the distance 5 code has about half the error of all of the distance 3 codes. And it also has lower error probability than the average of the distance 3 codes for all of the times that we measured from 1 to 25. Though you will observe that there are a couple of times when an individual code, one of those pink triangles, does have lower error than the distance 5. Besides looking at the probabilities, we can also look at the logical error per cycle, basically the probability of each cycle that we accidentally flip our logical value. And this is based on a fit to these curves, specifically looking at the exponential decay of the fidelity. And what we observe for distance 5 is an error per cycle of 2.9%, which again is with no post-selection, not tossing away any data here. And um, there are a couple minor subtleties I would raise with this fit. First, we skip the very first point, time equals 1. And that's because the very beginning of the experiment, there is no history of previous errors that can mess up the codes. So the effect of logical performance is better in a way that advantages the larger code. So we skip that from the fit because it doesn't really fit the model of a constant error per cycle. We also consider drift that might happen between individual experiments when we're evaluating the error bar on these values for the error per cycle. Finally, I want to highlight a few best practices that we've developed while working on this experiment. The first is to use a large number of cycles. Here we're looking at 25. Then we don't discard any of the repetitions, for example, due to leakage. We also use random initial states, which is another time boundary effect to try to start the codes on equal footing. And we interleave the codes and shuffle the time order in which we take them in order to remove any effects due to systematic drift over time. We can also compare to a simulation, and we see reasonable agreement. This is something that uh, another presentation will, will touch on in a few minutes. Now, it was not the case that we just plugged this thing in and it worked perfectly right away. Actually, we improved the performance over time significantly among many axes, such as the gates, the data qubit idle, uh, the compilation of our circuit, and decoding. And several follow-up presentations in a few minutes will cover these in greater detail. But something that's very interesting is to look retrospectively at these experiments and to compare how distance 3 and distance 5 improved relative to each other while we improve the system performance. And that's what's plotted on the right here, where we're looking at the distance 3 success per cycle on the horizontal axis and distance 5 on the vertical. So earlier on, we saw better performance for distance 3. And that's basically the performance wasn't good enough for adding qubits to be worthwhile. But as we improve the system, we observe empirically that the distance 5 improved about twice as fast until we finally kind of broke through this sound barrier and saw distance 5 finally outperforming distance 3. Now we're interested in very low error rates, um, exponentially lower than what we're looking at in the service code now. And a way to explore those today is using repetition codes, which are like a one-dimensional, easier version of surface codes. They allow us to test these larger distances, but they're not fully protected logical qubits. And to learn more about these, check out the paper listed at the bottom of this slide.
we can fit, for example, a distance 25 repetition code snaking across the same 49 qubits that we use for the distance 5 surface code. And we see exponential suppression of the logical error as we increase the code size up to a point. And it looks like we're kind of running into trouble at about one in a million. And it turns out that that particular floor was due to a single cosmic ray event that struck the device during the course of the 500,000 repetitions that we ran for this experiment. And if you remove that very, very narrow slice of data, you see that the exponential suppression continues down to about the 10 to the minus 7 level. Now, these cosmic ray events are something that, that are very important to address with a hardware fix in order to get quantum error correction to work. And to learn more about them, check out the other paper that I listed at the bottom of this slide. And we clearly need to keep exploring lower and lower error regimes to find, for example, what lurks at one part in a trillion. One last remark here is kind of tricky to measure logical errors that are this small. We're looking at 25 million total cycles in that last data point and only a handful of logical errors that actually occurred. Now let me conclude by taking a look back towards practical quantum error correction. And this experiment that we've done today is comparing a distance 3 to distance 5 surface code and measuring that scaling and seeing that performance is good enough to actually see a modest improvement in logical performance when we add more qubits to the code. But this is only the beginning of the story. We have a long road ahead of us. And basically, we want to make our surface code data look a lot more like that repetition code data. This will require significant performance improvements, like a factor of 3 to 10 across a wide variety of error mechanisms. And we also need to address many challenging error sources, such as leakage and cosmic rays that we've discussed here. All the while, it's crucial to test these ideas at larger and larger codes and smaller and smaller logical errors in order to build this bridge to the algorithmic logical performance that we need. Thank you.